maths fans, Dr. Tom Crawford here from the University of Oxford, bringing you some Christmas themed calculus. There are two functions that we're going to be investigating. The first one is given by z is equal to minus x squared plus y squared all to the power of one half. And the second function is going to be a function of x and y. So f of x, y is going to be equal to m over r squared e to the r squared y plus 5 over 2 x squared times m minus a. And our starting point is in fact going to be to try to plot the 3D graph of this first function. Now the first thing to spot with this function is that z is always going to be negative because of the minus sign outside of the square root. Also, because we're adding together two square numbers, they will each always be positive, therefore their sum is positive, and so the square root makes sense. So ultimately, z is really just determined by the value of x squared plus y squared, and as both x and y change, x squared plus y squared will change, and that ultimately will change z. Since we have two variables that can both change, x and y, what we're going to do is actually consider x squared plus y squared equal to some constant value, and let's call it c squared. So we know that x squared plus y squared is a positive commodity because it's two squared numbers added together. So therefore, if we square our constant, that emphasizes this positivity of the function. And what we want to do is consider what this looks like for different values of c. Now, some of you may recognize this equation and actually know what the graph of this function would look like for different values of c. But don't worry if you've never seen it before because we're gonna go through it step by step. And the first step, in fact, is to make a trigonometric substitution and all will become clear, so do bear with me if you've never seen this before. So we're going to let x be equal to c times cos of theta, and then y is going to be c times sine of theta. So when you substitute these two expressions into our equation, we're going to get c squared times cos squared theta from the x term plus c squared times sine squared theta from the y term. And since we know that cos squared plus sine squared is just one, this does indeed equal c squared. So this substitution makes complete sense and doesn't actually alter our original equation. So now we can plot these two values of x and y for different values of theta. So if I have my axes down here, so let's say this is x and this is y. So when theta is zero, which means along the x axis, we measure theta from the positive x axis in that direction. So when theta is zero, I'm going to get x is equal to c and y will be zero. So I'm going to be at this point down here, c zero. Now, as I increase theta up to let's say 90 degrees or pi by two, then y is going to be equal to c times sine of 90, that's one, so c, and x is c times cos of 90, which is zero. So we're actually at theta equals 90, we're up here. Then as we increase theta further, we go to 180, that actually takes us to the point minus c. So cos of pi is minus one, so x is minus c, sine of pi is zero, so we get y. And you may have spotted the pattern, this is gonna continue around. And so for three pi over two or 270 degrees, we get minus c down the bottom. Now we don't yet know how to join up these points. Again, some of you may have spotted what's happening. 
But if we think about values in between, so let's focus on this first positive quadrant. So we know that this is theta equals zero, and we know that this one is theta equals pi over two, or theta equals 90. Now, as I increase theta, cos decreases away from one. So cos is decreasing. So as I increase theta, the value of x is decreasing, which is why we go from c back down to zero. And at the same time, the sine function is increasing as theta goes from zero through to 90 degrees or pi by two. So y is increasing as x is decreasing. And if you were to plot a few points in between, you'd get this lovely curve shape between the two points. And as you may have guessed or may have already known, this is in fact drawing out a circle. So what we have from this equation, x squared plus y squared equals c squared, this is actually the equation for a circle of radius c. So it would look something, try and join up these points, something like that. And that's actually a better circle than I was expecting. Now, how does this help us to plot our original function z equals minus the square root of x squared plus y squared? Well, we have set x squared plus y squared to be this constant c squared. So if we substitute this in, what we've really got here is z equals minus c. And so as we vary the value of c, which remember we've worked out is the radius of our circle. As we vary the value of c, z is just equal to minus that value. So if we draw out lots of different circles for different values of the radius, what's gonna happen is in three dimensions, z takes the value c as we move down the negative z axis. So putting all of this together to create a 3D picture, near to the origin, so this point represents the origin, near to the origin, we're going to have a small circle and z is going to be minus the radius of that small circle. So z is very, just a little bit below the xy plane if that were going through this horizontal line here, through the origin. And then as we increase the radius of our circle, z becomes more and more negative. So what we're really doing here is adding together lots and lots of circles like this, extending down and away from zero. So if we have this as the xy plane, which is going to be flat at z equals zero through the origin, then as we just draw these circles with increasing radius equal to c, z, remember, is now minus the radius of the circle. So a little bit below zero, we have a small radius, and as we get more and more negative with z, larger overall size, the circles get bigger and bigger. And so this actually creates a cone shape. And just to check that our intuition is correct, we can plot this function, z equals minus x squared plus y squared all to the power of a half in the Maple Calculator app. And as you can see, we do indeed get this lovely cone shape in all of its three-dimensional glory. If I now add a star on top of our cone shape, and maybe a few blue, let's call them Christmas baubles, or maybe even fairy lights, who knows at this point, then our cone has turned into a lovely Christmas tree, sort of. Now let's look at our second function, f of x, y is equal to m over r squared e to the r squared y plus 5 over 2 x squared multiplied by m minus a. And we're going to be calculating some partial derivatives of this function. In fact, we're going to be working out the divergence of f, which I will explain very shortly. But before I get to that, what we're going to start with is actually to simplify the functional form of f. And what I mean by this 
is kind of group together all of these various constants to see what the real structure of the function looks like. Because x and y here are our only variables. So everything else in the equation, we've got m, r, and also an a, they're all just constants. So we can actually say that this is approximately, we've got a constant times e to the constant y. So let's say that's a times e to the b y, where a is going to be m over r squared and b is going to be r squared. And then we've got plus some other complicated constant, let's call it c. So c is 5 over 2 times m minus a, and that's all multiplied by x squared. So the functional form, the general structure of f, is constant e to the constant y plus constant times x squared. And this makes it much easier now to actually calculate those partial derivatives df by dx and df by dy. We can actually go one step further and assign numerical values to our constants a, b, and c. So for example, if we set a is equal to one, b is two, and c is equal to three, then we can plot the function z equals e to the two y plus three x squared. And doing this in the Maple Calculator app gives us something that I'm gonna call the chair function. You could even say that it perhaps looks like a very budget version of Santa's sleigh, but again, that might be a bit of a stretch. If we now calculate the partial derivatives for the generalized function, then we will get df by dx is going to be equal to 2cx because the first term only depends on y and so therefore we ignore it when we do the x partial derivative. And then df by dy, now we're only interested in the first term because the second one depends only on x and so therefore is constant when doing the y partial. So this will give us the b will come down and we'll get b a e to the b y. Now I mentioned before that we actually want to calculate the divergence of f and the divergence of a function is equal to the sum of its partial derivatives. So in three dimensions, which is where this is traditionally used, this would be df by dx plus df by dy plus df by dz. But since here we're working in 2D and we just have a function of x and y, the divergence here is equal to the sum of the partials, which here will be df by dx plus df by dy. And this, of course, is exactly the same as doing df by dy plus df by dx. So doing exactly that, we have that the divergence of f is equal to b a e to the b y plus 2 c x. And now remembering that we substituted for a, b, and c from our original expression for f, we can now substitute back to get the final answer for the divergence of f, which is equal to m times e to the r squared, which is r times r y, plus x times m minus a, all multiplied by 5, also known as Merry Christmas. So that just leaves me to say thank you to everyone for watching not only this video, but all of my videos from this past year. I hope you've all had as much fun watching them as I know I have making them. Please do remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and I'll see you all in 2021.